Good morning. Please turn in your authorized version of the scriptures, commonly known as the King James Version. If you do not have an authorized version of the scriptures, why? Why? Don't get anything else. Don't get a Bible. Get the authorized version of the scriptures. God's perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration, word of God. Okay, for English-speaking people. You take this, the authorized version of the scriptures, and use this as your base text to translate into other tongues. Okay? Uh, please, if you have an authorized version, please turn with me in your authorized version to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, verses 4 and verse 8. Now, Matthew chapter 24 is talking about what is known as the time of Jacob's trouble, erroneously referred to as the Great Tribulation. Uh, you, uh, that gets derived onto you by Catholicism, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, and her army, the Jesuit Order. Okay, It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Why? Because the Church of God, the Church of the Living God, is not there during that time period. We, the Church of the Living God, get redeemed, resurrected, um, caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, And our Lord Jesus Christ is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble in Matthew chapter 24. These false prophets will come and tell you about Matthew chapter 24 that this is doctrine for us today. It is not. He's speaking to Jews telling the Jews about the time of Jacob's trouble that is coming upon them after we, the Church of the Living God, are redeemed, resurrected, okay? But, to instruct us in some righteousness, Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 unto verse 8, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Christ means anointed one. Okay? Anointed one. Jesus Christ. Jehovah saves. The anointed one. Okay? Our Lord Jesus Christ. The Word made flesh. Okay? And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, which is coming soon to a theater near you, and pestilences. A uh, true pestilence from famine, or fictitious make-believe, Jesuitical psychological operation uh, pestilences, like as the poison crown, and earthquakes in divers places. And earthquakes are happening more rapidly than ever before. People like to say, well, now we can measure them. Okay, yea, hath God said. Verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. What we're seeing here today, brethren, people, Church of the Living God, and those of you who are lost, uh, is just the beginning of things. It's going to be heightened even worse after we, the Church of the Living God, get out of here. Okay? If you're not saved, why? Why? To fool yourself, huh? Hmm. Many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, the anointed one. Hmm going to be going over a deplorable, absolutely deplorable article. Um, uh, what is this? Uh, from USA Today. And this, uh, I'm going, I will put the, the article in the description, okay? But uh, this, this is an absolutely disgusting article. Written by a Christian. Christian, yeah. Uh, just, just so y'all know, I am not a Christian. 
<gasps> Brother? <laughs> the word Christian appears three times in the authorized version of the scripture. Okay? There are many Christians today, Catholics, who are your enemy. The Jesuit order, who are your enemy. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Roman Catholicism, Satan's church, they are your enemy. There are many people out there who call themselves Christians. And to be honest with you, I want nothing to do with that. And this close to we, the Church of the Living God, being resurrected, redeemed, there needs to be distinction. Because anybody can be a Christian. People like to preach what is called easy believism, where you save yourself by you just believing what is factual, without coming to the Lord broken, contrite, and in fear of the Lord, call upon his name, which is true scriptural salvation. Many dispute that. And when the Lord save you, you are a new creature. Okay? Many uh, like to dispute that as well. But see, those types are Christians. Lutherans, they're Christians. Methodists, they're Christians. Charismatics, they're Christians. Really? Acts chapter 11. We're not going to get too deep into this, but we're going to look at the three occurrences of this. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And when he had found him and brought him unto Antioch, and, it came, when he, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Were called Christians first. Not by themselves. Not by themselves. The world called us Christians. In the scriptures, it's Church of God, which appears in the Pauline epistles, okay? It is the Church of God, or, which I prefer, the Church of the Living God, which is the ground and pillar of the truth, okay? We, those who are saved, born again, converted, you know, new creatures in Christ Jesus, we never refer to ourselves as Christians. Oh, you might be thinking about 1 Peter, right? We'll get to that very quickly, okay? Uh, I've, I've covered this before, but for sake of this video, I'm going to cover it again, okay? Now, we saw in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, they were called first Christians at Antioch. Lost people were calling them Christians, okay? Acts chapter 26, Acts chapter 26, verse 28. King Agrippa. Whom Paul was uh, witnessing unto in chains and bonds. <laughs> Verse 28 in Acts chapter 26. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. King Agrippa was not a saved man. King Agrippa was a heathen. Okay, He was not saved. So there again you see someone of the world lost calling Paul, making reference on to Paul uh, being a Christian, a lost man. Now the big one that everyone uh, likes to cling to. First Peter, First Peter chapter four. First Peter chapter four. I'm going to le read a little context here, okay? Verses thirteen on to verse verse seventeen, okay? And of course, please follow me along. I hope you have been, okay? 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 13 on to verse 17. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, 
that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Beg your pardon, brethren. If ye repro be reproached for the name of Christ, the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let, now pay attention, okay? Suffered for the name of Christ, okay? Jesus Christ, our God, our Father, okay? Not for being a Christian, but, but check this out, okay? Pay attention here. Look at verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Now, a murderer, a thief, evildoer, busybody, okay? Those are horrible things to be known as. In contrast, yet if any man suffer as a Christian... Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and that's not a building. That's us. Well, we're going to look at that as we go through this deplorable, despicable article written by a Christian. Okay? For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us... What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? If it begins at us, the church of the living God. Look at verses 15 and 16. What is Christian in context being compared unto? It's better for you to suffer as a Christian than a murderer, thief, evildoer, busybody, or other men's matters. Uh, verses 15 and 16 do not denote unto you that it's the greatest of glories to die as a Christian or being known as a Christian. The comparison is between 15 and 16, it's better to be to die or suffer as a Christian rather than to suffer as a murderer, thief, evildoer, busybody in other men's matters. Okay? Okay? Worldly things, these are. They called us the Christians. We did not refer to ourselves as Christians. Okay? Peter here is making the comparison. Yeah, it's better to die as a Christian rather than a murderer, thief, busybody in uh, other men's matters, or evildoer, or busybody in other men's matters. Yeah. Better to die as being known as a Christian than one of those things. But see, in context, Christian. Not what we called ourselves, what they label us. Because those who are going to kill you or make you suffer being of the church of the living God, what are they going to label you as? Huh? What are they going to label you as? Christian. So see, in context, Peter is not giving, um, make it, saying it's okay for us to call ourselves Christians. He's making the comparison that it's better to suffer as a Christian rather than what? A murderer, thief, evildoer, or busybody in other men's matters. Still, those things, murderer, thief, evildoer, busybody, Christian, those are five, five, the number of death, Five terms derived from the world labeled on others. They're labels. We did not call ourselves that. Search the scriptures. Do a search. Do a search. Church of God appears eight times somewhere along that line. Church of the living God only appears once. Only appears once. First Timothy chapter 3. See, God is a God of, his, of um, distinction, people. And right now, today, and you're going to see, um, what is being termed Christian is nothing but worldly. We need to be distinct as the church of the living God. And not to be named with those who will be labeled by the world as Christians. Okay? 
Being Christian, being named Christian by the world, is a label given to us by them. That's what Peter was talking about, people. Okay? Uh, what was this? 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. House of God. That's not a building. House of God. When the Lord Jesus Christ saves you, you are of his house. Okay? You are of his house. You see that in the Old Testament scriptures. They that are of your house. It's not a building. Okay? You, we are his bones and his flesh. We are part of him. We are part, part of his body. We are not little Christs, but we are part of him because he dwells in us, sealed until the day of redemption, circumcision made without hands, see? So we are of the house of God, okay? House of God in the New Testament is not a building, okay? But, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The pillar and ground of the truth. I say that backwards sometimes when I rattle it off from my memory. But pillar and ground of the truth. Church of the living God. Inaccurately referred to as Christians. Referred to as Christians by the world. And by those who want to infiltrate what is the true Church of the Living God or Church of God? Jesuits. Okay? I'm not a Christian. If you're saved, born again, converted, and a new creature in Jesus Christ, look at me. You're not a Christian either. Nor should you be referring to yourself as. Okay? I don't care that throughout history people called themselves Christians. I don't care. What say the scriptures? Okay? The church of the living God is supposed to be the pillar, strong, and ground of the truth. The truth is to come from us. And the Christians today? Now, let us begin with this filth, this article written by a Christian. You can disagree with me all you want. I'm not a Christian. I'm of the church of the living God. I'm saved, born again, converted, a new creature in Christ Jesus. I'm not a Christian. God is a God of distinction. And in these days, people, distinction, separation, is very important. So, going to be reading this article onto you verbatim, best I can. I also put it in the description box so you can see for yourself, okay? Stop, here is the name of the article. Stop using religion to fight COVID-19 vaccine. Taking it is the Christian thing to do. Hmm. Nearly half of white... Interesting that they bring that up. Nearly half of white evangelicals say they won't take vaccine, but edict to love thy neighbor should inspire them to help America reach herd immunity. Herd. Interesting choice of words there. This Dr. Andrew Wong. Dr. Andrew Wong. Yeah. Let's continue this. Herd. Oh, like ra uh, gathered as sheeps to, uh, sheep to the slaughter? Or in their case, as goats to the, sh uh, to the slaughter? Yeah, herd. Yeah, 
Very interesting choice of words. As a doctor and a Christian, I am struck by the profound difference that my fellow Christians could make in the trajectory of the pandemic by getting vaccinated. The <laughs> Delta variant, a much more transmissible form of COVID-19, threatens a new round of restrictions and a new round of deaths. And nearly all the deaths involve people who haven't been vaccinated. That's a lie. That's a lie. The proof is still out there for you to look that up. The proof is still out there for you to look that up. See, they want to turn those who get the steal of the Jesuit poniard against those who don't to bring about civil unrest so that martial law may be brought in. Okay? Earlier this year, 45% of white evan evangelical adults said they would not be vaccinated. According to a Pew Research Center survey, a Pew Research Center survey, that amounts to more than 45 million Americans or 14% of the population based on the 2020 census of American religion. <laughs> and who, took, who takes that census? Oh, that would be the Jesuit order, the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, one of the things I'm going to be reading a portion to you out of is the testimony of Alberto Rivera, a man who was a Jesuit and got out of the Jesuits and became uh, the uh, primost whistleblower of the Jesuit order for our times, okay? The Jesuits are infiltrators, and they infiltrate to get all kinds of information to be used against you, okay? And they, that information is sent back to the Vatican and stored on computers, which Alberto Rivera, even, we're not going to look at that, gives uh, credence to him himself, okay? So, yes, th that's a very interesting point that the, based on the 2020 census of American religion, if this group alone accepted the COVID-19 vaccine, we would begin to close in on herd immunity and move beyond this painful and dead, deadly season, which the Jesuit order wants nothing to do with. They want, they're bringing this all about. It is a psychological operation brought about by the Jesuit order, okay? And while I feel powerless to do or say anything to overcome the political divides that contribute to vaccine hesitation, I feel equally sure that Christians who weigh the vaccination decision from a strictly Christ-centered point of view ultimately will be moved to acceptance. Many will come in my name saying I am Christ. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness, like this whack job, Andrew Wong, okay? And it was Satan himself in Isaiah chapter 15, uh, 14, verses 12 on to verse 15. You look that up on your own time. Satan wants to be God. He is a counterfeit. He is a, a copycat. He is a phony. Okay? Keep that in mind. So, come on, come on. I'm, I'm using my other laptop here. For reasons, the reasons for Christian vaccine hesitant, hesitancy are varied. But the most convicting reason to overcome that reluctance is what Jesus described as the second Great commandment after loving the, uh, loving the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Hmm. Okay. Christ, Christ's followers are called to sacrifice in his name as Jesus offered himself as the perfect sacrifice to atone for our sins. Sacrifice ourselves, huh? 
Okay? Let's look at this. Matthew chapter 22. Now here's what this whack job, this devil, isn't giving you people in this article. Where he's talking about. He just quotes something without giving you anything to uh, fact check him on. Okay? The thing you've got to remember too, brethren, people, um, Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 22, where we, this, this lovely Christian is trying to quote from, is written before the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means doctrinally, dispensationally, it was still the Old Testament. Hey, read Hebrews chapter 9. The whole chapter. When does the New Testament begin? I'll give you a clue. It begins with the death of the testator. Who is the testator? Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. It didn't begin with the birth. The ones who tell you that are Catholics. Okay? But, here's what this fool, who says in his heart there is no God. This is, here's what this fool is trying to tell you. Let's read the context of it, shall we? Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 under verse 40. Okay? Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 under verse 40. Okay? We're going to get some context here. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. Now, a Pharisee and a Sadducee. A Pharisee is someone who takes tradition, like a Catholic, and holds tradition above the scriptures. Okay? And a Sadducee is just someone who is, is spiritual. Not really religious. Okay? Simplest way to put it. Verse 25. Uh, let's continue in verse 24. Saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, the first when he had married a wife, deceased, and, having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third, unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Now, the resurrection of the church of the living God, the body of Christ, is erroneously referred to on as the rapture, which is rapidly coming. That's when we, the church of the living God, are caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Listen to what our Lord says. And this, our Lord right here himself is rebuking this devil. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Like this Andrew Wong guy. He doesn't know the scriptures or the power of God. Why isn't he giving the verse references here in this little article? I would have. Why is that? Well, let's continue. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Yes, we're going to be likened unto angels. Remember when John, when the one angel comes to him and uh, does to worship him, John says that's in the book of Revelation uh, 20-ish somewhere. But John said uh, he worships the angel and the angel guy touches him. He's like, oh, whoa, hey, see thou do it not. I am of thy fellow servants, thy brethren. Worship God. Okay, that was one of us, the church of the living God who get caught up. And when we come back down with our Lord at the second coming, okay, we are likened unto angels, of, uh, unto the angels of God in heaven, okay? But as touching the resurrection of the dead, ye have not, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And isn't it interesting that Catholics have this big fascination with death, and like, put things on dead people's skulls and, uh, you know, they practice perfect e uh, abomination, uh, like embalming, like the uh, physicians of Egypt did. Hmm? 
Okay? And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. The one, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great, com great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great command, first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And the law was there until John. Okay? The law and the prophets prophesied until John. John the Baptist. Okay? Okay? More on that in a bit. Okay? But we're going to touch a little bit more deeply on this love your neighbor as yourself thing. But let's continue a little bit in this uh, devil's article. And you're going to see why I refer to this man as a, as a devil. Okay? As Paul wrote in his letter to the Philippians, let each of you look not on his own interests, but also on the interests of others. In his letter to the Ephesians, he called on us to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay? So, Philippians now. In the New Testament. Philippians. We want Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. We want verses 1 on to verse 11. Now you're going to note something here. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 11. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, if you're saved, other words, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. How can those of us who are of the church of the living God have, be of one mind with the Christians? How can you and I, of the church of the living God, be of one mind with the lost? Ain't gonna happen, people. It ain't going to happen. Okay? We're supposed to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Okay? Let's continue. So, verse 2 is talking about the fellowship of the brethren, the church of the living God. Okay? Verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other, let each esteem other better than themselves. We are to serve one another as the church of the living God. And yes, we are to serve others. Yes, we are. Okay, so let's continue. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And see, when this guy earlier talked about we are to sacrifice, okay? Um, imitating Christ? You're not told anywhere in the authorized version of the scriptures to imitate Christ. In the authorized version of the scriptures, the word imitate does not appear. The only ones who want you to imitate God are Satan and his church, Roman Catholicism. The imitation of Christ? That's what this guy's talking about. He wouldn't have to be a Catholic, would he? Hmm. Let's continue. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. 
and see what this guy was saying to you. What does he say to here? Uh, Christ followers are called to sacrifice in his name as Jesus offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to atone for our sins. This guy is telling you to imitate Christ, to sacrifice yourself as he sacrificed, uh, to make an atonement for sins, uh, telling you to imitate Christ, that you are a little God, basically. That's what he's telling you. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay? That's what he was uh, not telling you. He wasn't tell giving you the whole context. In context, that um, uh, looking out for others begins with what? We as the church of the living God, we are to take care of our own. Okay? We are to take care of our own, to provide for our own, those who are our brethren and sisters of the church of the living God, okay? It's what this devil isn't telling you. And then he mentions in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, what he's not telling you. Now, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 on to verse 21. We need the context here. What this guy is taking out this out of, Okay? Now note right away, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 under verse 21. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Followers of God as dear children. Lost people are not followers of God as dear children because they're not saved. Okay? And those who are Christians who merely believe are thieves and robbers. They go up another way instead of through the door. Through brokenness, contrition, and fear of the Lord. Okay? And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a s sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Okay? The us. He's talking about the church of the living God, those who are truly saved, born again, and converted new creatures. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. Fornication. Relations out uh, before marriage. Fornicating with the world. Uncleanness. You take the steel of the Jesuit poniard, you're going to be made unclean because of all the toxins that are in there. Or covetousness. Why are you taking the steel of the Jesuit poniard? Why? Because you want your coffee and donuts? Huh? Now they're putting it, uh, as I heard, uh, being talked about in Australia. No jab, no job. Really? Covetous. Covetous. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, uh, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, you miss, you messing around with Catholicism, you're a whoremonger. Nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, lover of your own self, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Spiritual. Okay? You're, 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 you people who this is addressed to, you are your own idols. You're an idolater. You are your own God. You Christian. Okay? You don't serve the true God of the scriptures. You do not serve the living God. You serve the little G God who is Satan, okay? Let no man deceive you with vain words, like this devil here. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Children, uh, uh, children of disobedience are those that hear the gospel and reject it. It's not someone who is saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, a new creature. No. This is in context 
because he says in verse 5, Who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God? No! Buddy, no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Okay? Meaning they ain't saved. Ch children of disobedience is referring on to people who are not saved. Okay? Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Lost people. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret, like what the Jesuit order does. Okay? But all things are but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, and wisdom is equated uh, to fearing the Lord. Uh, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Job 28 28, okay? Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Verse 17 is a perfect cross reference for Job 28 28. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Touch not the unclean thing, you know. Touch not the unclean thing. Okay? And be not drunk with wine, where is an excess. Wherein is excess, excuse me. But be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's what he just said. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Okay? So this devil bozo took that one verse and it says reverence for Christ. There's a difference between reverence and fear, by the way. Reverence. Fear. It's in the fear of God. And they, they say Christ, fear of God. The, the Christ he's referring to is that man of sin, the son of perdition. Inaccurately referred to as the Antichrist. Okay? So this guy is taking this way, way, way out of context. Okay? Now, a little bit more on this loving your neighbor as yourself. Okay? Let's read a little bit more on this. I have heard some Christians say that the pandemic is God's will and that God will decide whether we live or die. So they will leave their faith in God's hands. I too submit my life to God and understand that my every breath is granted by him. But I would never have become a doctor if I thought that helping people prevent and recover from illness was contrary to the will of God. Okay? Now, a little bit more, a little bit more on this loving your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? Go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount is the constitution of the kingdom of heaven. You will see faith mentioned only one time in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's fashioned in form of a rebuke. Okay? The Sermon on the Mount is all works. Which the kingdom of heaven is going to be. Because Jesus Christ, God our Father himself, is going to be sitting on the throne, ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. Beg your pardon. You don't need faith when you can see him personally. Okay? That's why Catholics love the Sermon on the Mount. 
Okay? The Sermon on the Mount is wonderful for instruction and righteousness for us today. See, you've got to rightly divide the word of truth, people. But doctrinally, the Sermon on the Mount does not apply for us. Matthew chapter 7. Here's something that a lot of people, a lot of these Christians like to say. Judge not that ye be not judged. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Doing something that even lost people know is sinful, but yet remember they're Christians because they just believe. Yeah, don't judge me. Yeah. Don't judge other people. Don't judge fruit. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, and considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye? Verse 5. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Now, some will look at that and say, well, no one's ever going to be able to pull the moat out of their eye, so you can't judge. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. You better judge. You better have judged. Okay? Romans chapter 2. Okay? The judgment that our Lord is talking about is hypocritical judgment. Okay? For example, okay, if I were still a sodomite, and a, a Christian sodomite. Yeah, go figure that one. But if I were still a sodomite, and I were to come up to you and say, God hates sodomy, he hates what you're doing, you need to repent of that and come to the Lord while still practicing sodomy, uh, I would be a hypocrite. That's me not pulling the moat out of my own, my own eye, even though I am a safe sinner. Okay? If I were a drunkard, getting drunk and schnuckered, and then go up to someone who's drinking, say, don't drink. That's evil. That's wicked. You're a drunkard. You're a fornicator. Repent. While I'm getting drunk, I would be a hypocrite. Not taking the mote out of my own eye. If I were doing drugs, you know, and go up to someone on drugs, you're doing evil. You need to repent of that. God hates what you're doing. While I was doing drugs, I would be a hypocrite. He's talking about hypocritical judgment, people. Okay? Because if you're not to judge, then how are you to know what is truth? By your feelings, right? Or by looking into a Bible? Yeah. But yet, the Christians tell you to judge the, their Bibles by your feelings. You see why there needs to be a distinction between those that call themselves Christians and those of us of the Church of the Living God? Romans chapter 2, verses 17 on to verse 24. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest, in, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. Okay, you're a Christian, right? And knowest as well, and approvest the things that are most more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light to them which are in darkness. Like this lovely individual here who wrote this despicable article, okay? An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge, form of knowledge, uh, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth and of the truth of the law. Right here. Thou therefore which teachest, teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal. Dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? See, he's talking about hypocritical judgment. Uh, being hypocrite, a hypocrite in your judgment, 
crosses dispensational lines. We are to judge, okay? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. We are to judge, people. Okay? We are to judge. Our feelings are not the standard. What is the standard? The authorized version of the scriptures. And the spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth. And who is the spirit of truth? Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. The Lord is that spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 the context in it, okay? So God himself will lead you and guide you into all truth. Okay? Not our feelings. And what is truth? Our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father by, but by him. And sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word, the authorized version of the scriptures, is truth. Not the Bibles. Okay? Okay, now a little bit more on this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Only devils, only devils, those who are lost, infiltrators, only those who are not of the church of the living God will put up a stink to you about, don't judge me, don't judge me, don't judge others, don't judge people by their fruits. First Corinthians chapter 5. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. <laughs> his father's wife. I don't believe this was his mother, or else our Lord would have said so in the scriptures. But notice how it says so much as not, uh, uh, not so much as named among the Gentiles. It's named among the Gentiles today. Showing you the times that we live in. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. What is he talking about? These Christians. Someone comes into them who is living in sin, calling themselves a Christian, right? And instead of kicking them out, they say, oh no, we, we're not going to judge you. you. Oh, okay, you're sleeping with your father's wife or, or you're in a sodomite relationship or you're a drunkard or a drug user or a Catholic or whatever. We're, we're not going to judge you. Look at how pious and righteous we are because we're not judging you. That's what he's talking about, the puffed up. You ever meet some of these Christians that go to these church buildings? We don't judge anyone. We don't judge. We, we love everybody. Yeah. Yeah. The love gospel. The love gospel. That's the gospel of devils. God's love is at Calvary. You go to Calvary, the cross. God's love is not for anyone who rejects the gospel. Okay? God does not love you. God's love is at the cross. God loved and he gave. Okay? The love of God is at the cross. Okay? You need to go there. Through brokenness, contrition, fear of the Lord. And in the fear of the Lord, you will call upon the name of the Lord. Okay? You need to go to the cross. God's love is not for you if you reject the gospel. You understand? And that, the love gospel, is what these devils, these Christians, tell you. Okay? And that's what he's talking about. We're not judging you. Hey, look, like that idiot uh, Brian Welch guy said. Look, hey, we're, we're Christians and we don't judge you. Yeah, many will come in my name. Yeah. Let's continue. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already. He wasn't there? Oh, oh, and Paul judged already? It's like, I don't even have to be, to be there. I hear, whoa, what's your guy's problems? As though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. Paul judged? 
But I thought Jesus said, judge not. It's hypocritical judgment, people. Someone who comes to you, don't judge me. That's you. <laughs> That's a pretty good indicator that they're not saved. Or they're Christian. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In the day of the Lord Jesus. What does this mean? If someone of the Church of the Living God gets messed up in sin, which can happen. That's what the books of First and Second Corinthians, uh, in their totality, are addressing. Okay, someone of the Church of the Living God who gets messed up in, in sin to be handed over onto Satan so that the skin suit, the flesh, will be uh, destroyed, that the spirit may be saved, okay? Handed over to Satan, okay? Verse 6, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, the old man, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must he needs go out of the world. Remember, we are in the world. We are not of the world. Okay? We're going to be amongst the lost. We are ambassadors. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 on to verse 21. Read it. Okay? Those of us who are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, a new creature in Christ Jesus. Okay? Um, we are ambassadors. We are ministers of reconciliation. We have the word of reconciliation, okay? We are ambassadors, okay? We're going to be amongst the lost. But context. But now have I written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one know not to eat. Kick him out. Don't bring them in. You kick them out. That's what he's saying. If someone is a brother and doing the things that the lost people do, don't, oh, we love you. Come on, we're not going to, hey, 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 brother, you in sin, get away from me, okay? I don't want you to come around tempting me or anything like that. You, you, you go. You go. You get yourself right with the Lord, okay? We, you and I might not have fellowship ever again. But you got bigger things to worry about. You get away from me. Get out. See? Verse 12 and verse 13. For what have I to do to judge <gasps> them that are without? Do ye do not ye judge them that are within? Judge? We're supposed to judge? Yeah. But them that are without, lost people, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. You are to judge. And what are we to judge by? The scriptures. Not a Bible. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who doth know it? I, the Lord, know the heart, and try the reins, to give unto every man according as his works be. I just bradized that. That's in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 on to verse 10. Look it up. The heart is deceitful. You can't trust your feelings. You can't trust your emotions. We are to judge. We have a perfect standard, the authorized version of the scriptures. Why are the Bibles always being updated? Because they're not perfect. They're from Rome. They're satanic. Someone comes around you calling themselves a Christian, number one, be okay. Gotta have a little grace for that, by the way, too. Because people calling themselves Christians over the centuries 
has caught on, unfortunately. But in these times, there needs to be distinction. There needs to be separation. Okay? Catholics are Christians. Jesuits are Christians. And they're the enemy. Going through the palaver of, well, they, don't call them, we're, they're not real Christians. We're not, no, abandon it altogether, brethren. Abandon it altogether. Church of God, church of the living God. Okay? Verse 6, and go back to Matthew chapter 7. Okay? Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn in again and rend you. Dogs, men, swine, women. Oh. Cast not that which is holy separate other unto dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Okay? If someone doesn't want to hear the gospel, whether it be a man, don't uh, give not that which is holy unto dogs, men, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, women, who don't want to hear the gospel. Why? What happens when they don't want to hear that or uh, receive these things? Lest they trample them uh, under their feet and turn again and rend you. Someone doesn't want to hear it. You're trying to force it down their throat. Hit, uh, take the scriptures and bash them over the head, which I am guilty of doing myself before. I've done that before. And they turn and rend you. It's like, hey, you know, when we go tracting, can I offer you a gospel track? No, no, thank you. It's like, okay, go to the next one. Um, can I can I show you, you what you know? You're saying something about not judging. Can I show you what the scriptures say? No. Okay. When someone doesn't want to hear the truth, you trying to badger them and persist when they've made it obvious, if you continue, like I've done before in the past, you can make it worse. Back off. Let them alone. Okay? Let's continue. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Okay? Well, what man is there of you whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask? Him. Verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Verses 7 on to verse 12 is a perfect description of what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. Instruction in righteousness. Okay? Look at that. Look at that. Okay? Verses 7 and 8. He's talking about uh, seeking him, seeking the Lord, okay? And he will not turn away anyone who is genuinely seeking them, uh, seeking him through a broken and contrite heart, okay? Because a broken and contrite heart is a heart that belongs unto the Lord. A heart that is broken and contrite and comes unto the Lord Jesus Christ will have the fear, will be given the fear of the Lord. And in the fear of the Lord, he will call upon their name, uh, call upon his name, excuse me, okay? Call upon his name, not their name, excuse me. One God comprised of spirit, soul, and body. Not a, not a satanic trinity like Roman Catholicism likes to teach you. Okay? It's nothing like that. Nothing like that. But, verse 9 under verse 12, look at that. Of what man is there of you whom if his son, your own, your own blood, your own flesh, asks bread, will he give him a stone? If your neighbor is needy of something, comes to you, if you got it, give it to him. Yes. Amen. Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? 
If that if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, those of your own, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The golden rule. Um, I don't want you to die without knowing who Jesus Christ is and without him saving you. You take the steel of the Jesuit Punyard, you got about three to five years tops of your lifespan before you die. I don't want these things that the Jesuits are doing to us done to me. There's no way I would do that to you. See, this Andrew Wong devil here, whatever, this devil, he's got an agenda. He's twisting truth and telling you that doing that which is evil is good and saying Jesus would be okay with it. Right. Let's continue. Now, Pay attention, especially for our instruction and in righteousness for us today, right now. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that many there be which go in their act. Like these Christians in the church buildings, the hirelings, who muzzled up. Why? Because they're government churches, by the way. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth on to life. And few, very few, and few there be that find it. Narrow. Broad. Do you get it? Christian thing to do. Yeah. Amen. It is the Christian thing to do. But someone of the church of the living God? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Taking the steel of the Jesuit poniard, that's the Christian thing to do. If you loved your neighbor, you would go ahead and kill yourself for him. Right, right. Ye shall know them by their fruits. How are you to know what the fruit is unless you judge? <laughs> Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? How are you to tell between thorns and figs and thistles unless you judge? This is very simple kind of stuff. Remember, people who say to you, don't judge me, that's a defensive action to, because they know they've done something that is evil. It's a very good sign that they ain't saved. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits shall ye shall know them. And how are you to know their fruits unless you judge their fruits? People. This man who wrote this article, he's not saved. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? 
like this Christian guy does, like these Christians in the buildings do. And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which, buildeth with, which built his house upon a rock. And no other foundation can be laid than that which is laid, which is what? Christ Jesus. He is the rock on whom the church is built. Not Peter, you Catholics. Okay? Because rock, Petra, Petros, Petra, big rock, Petros, a small stone. I might have those backwards, but Christ is a big rock where Peter is a little small stone. Okay? Look at this. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Psalm, 50, uh, Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. Check them out. That's what the scriptural definition of a fool is. Which built his house upon the sand. When you look at sand, are they not minuscule grains of stones? Little minuscule stones? Sand is finite stone? Little pebbles? Little stones? There ain't no way Peter is that rock that the church is built on, you disgusting Catholics. God help you. The true God. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I skipped something, didn't I? Verse 25. Let's read, let's read the verses 24 on to verse 27 again. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon the rock. Upon a rock, excuse me. And that rock is Christ. What happens when your faith is built on Jesus Christ, when you are of the church of the living God? And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. The rain descended, coming down in sheets of rain, like all the stuff that the Jesuits are pushing on us. And the floods came, peoples, floods of propaganda, floods of false uh, information, False, uh, uh, these Christians, floods of people, okay? And the winds blew. And beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Verse 26. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and when... And the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. When the winds and floods and the rain comes, no jab, no job, muzzle up, you can't buy or sell, say that you have the steel of the Jesuit poniard. One is built on the, a rock, our Lord Jesus Christ, and another is built upon the sand, and sand consists of minuscule little stones. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. To love your neighbor as yourself is not that you kill yourself out of love for your neighbor. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I would not wish upon any of you, even, even my greatest enemies, who probably, as far as I know, have taken the steel of the Jesuit poniard. I wouldn't wish that upon my greatest enemies because your fate is sealed. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 under verse 12. A little bit more on what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk, and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Hold your place here. Hold your place here and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Holding your vessels in honor. Talking about your body. Okay? Why? Okay, look at that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses 3. On to verse 5 again. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Fornication with the world. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Why? How should? What does he mean by that? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 16 on to verse 18. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Now, the temple of God, Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Only those who are truly saved, born again, converted, of the church of the living God, who are new creatures in Christ Jesus, only those who are truly saved, have the Spirit of God, and the Lord is that Spirit dwelling within them. Only saved people have the Spirit of God in them. Okay? If any man, if any man is not discriminant, lost, or even you yourself, if any man, lost or saved, defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, separate. Which temple ye are? Like this Andrew Wong guy, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. Let's continue reading here. <clears throat> Verse, uh, on the verse 20. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore let no man glory in men, which this Andrew, uh, Andrew Wong guy is doing. Okay? For all things are yours. Let's, let's keep reading. Whether Paul or Apollos or Kephas or the world or life or death or things present, present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ's. And Christ is God's, meaning you're saved. So when you go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Why? Because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Lord is that spirit. The spirit of God is in you. That seal until the day of redemption. That circumcision made without hands. And if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Uh, those of you who are saved, you mess around with sin, hand it over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, the skin suit, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Do you get it? Beg your pardon. Okay, do you get it? Okay? Let's continue. Verse, uh, verse 5 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, 
as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness, separation. God wouldn't call you unto receiving the steel of the Jesuit poniard to become of the number of the herd to eventually die in three to five years? Come on now. Come on now. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. There again, proving this devil wrong. Okay? You, do, you take in that steel of the Jesuit poniard and you're a Christian? You're despising God. Okay? If you are truly saved and born again. If you are truly saved and born again, a new creature in Christ Jesus, he's not going to lead you to take that. He won't. He won't. This man is lying to you. He is not saved. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God how to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Here's another thing about uh, as you would do unto others, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself. Okay? And that ye study to be quiet. And to, work, and to do your own business. And to work with your own hands as we commanded you. And let's verse uh, verse 12. That ye may walk honestly, that's why I said originally, excuse me, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, not saved, and that ye may have lack of nothing. Mind your own business. Okay? <laughs> I'm not going to presume upon myself and kill myself because I love my neighbor. No, because the, my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if any man, including myself, defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. And God was close to doing that by the way I was eating before he gave me a thorn in the flesh, my heart problems. But study to be quiet. Mind your own business. You know, don't presume upon your neighbor by getting into his business. Well, I'm doing this because I love you. I wouldn't do it for you. I wouldn't do it for you. But rather what I would do, what I am doing, is telling you the truth. This guy isn't doing. Let's go to 1 Peter. Because see, these Christians, so-called, <laughs> these Christians... Are the you know like my father here, my uh, earthen father? He's one of these. It's like it's your Christian duty to take the steel of the Jesuit poniard. I'm doing this because I love you. You lost. <laughs> First Peter chapter three verses eight hundred verse sixteen. Finally, be ye all of one mind. How can you and I, saved of the Church of the Living God? Be of one mind with that. And you're a Christian and you want to be one mind with the world? There's a problem there. Houston, we have a problem. You're not saved. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrariwise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from speaking evil, and his lips that they speak no guile, like this guy is doing. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? 
But if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, nor, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they, remember what we looked at at the beginning of this world, uh, of this uh, video, excuse me, uh, how they of the world will call those that call you that, label you Christian, right? They be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Like these people do. Then of course, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. See, this guy here, this Andrew Wong, whatever his name is, okay? This guy here, he is, uh, he's of the world. He's of the world. He's, he's telling you to be part of the world, okay? He is. That's what his whole goal is, to make you be one with the world, to be like the world, to win the world, okay? That's what he's telling you. That's what these Christians in the building are telling you. That's your Christian duty to do so. That's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie. I beseech you therefore, brethren, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, separate, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. These guys, these Catholic devils, are telling you to be like the world. And be not conformed to this world, what this guy is telling you to do. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Who are you proving it to? Yourself? No, to them. See? And of course, Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs now, chapter 25. Yeah, these, these Christians, they're taking, they're calling that which is evil good and that which is good evil. We as the church of the living God are separate, holy, other than that. And these guys want you to go and go ahead and take the steel of the Jesuit poniard. Absolute insanity. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it, don't do it. Proverbs chapter 25, verses 4 on to verse 13. Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. Talking about being separation. Separating the dross from the silver, that it be a pure vessel. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne shall be established in righteousness. Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king, and stand not in the place of great men. For it is better that it be said unto thee, Come up hither. Come up hither. You know, you're not your own God, by, by the way, because you save yourself by your belief. Okay? For it is better that it be said unto thee, Come up hither, than that thou shouldest put, be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. Go not forth, forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof, when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. Striving with your neighbor. Let me give you a good example. Going over to your neighbor's house um, and badgering them about the steal of the Jesuit poignard, and then saying, well, I'm a Christian. I'm doing this because I love you. And your neighbor's like, dude, no, I don't want to get away from me. But I'm a Christian, okay? I'm supposed to do this. I'm doing this for you. Well, I wouldn't do it for you. Okay? Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself. And you look in the scripture about debate, it's never a good thing. And discover not a secret to another, lest he that heareth it put thee to shame, and thine infamy turn not away. A word fitly spoken. Now here's the contrast between someone who is uh, going forth hastily to strive and debating with his neighbor. Okay? When it gets to that point, 
where you have to debate your cause with your neighbor yourself, you got to be careful what you say because your neighbor will use it against you. See? And that comes from what? Going forth hastily to strive. Not being quiet. Not minding your own business. Not doing unto others as you would have them to do unto you. The true meaning of love your neighbor as yourself. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pitchers of silver. As an, ear, as an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover on to, upon an obedient ear. Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. As the cold of snow in the, in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him, for he refreshes the soul of his masters. Okay? And of course, Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. Verse 22 under verse 24. Um, uh, on to verse 25, excuse me. Um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Study to shoe, uh, study to be, your, uh, study to be quiet, minding your own business. You know, if your neighbor comes over to you, it's like, hey, I, I can you, I, you know, my, our water got shut off. Can I, sure. Okay. Like, uh, our best friend recently took in someone who, um, was out, was without shelter. Okay lost his home, and um, staying with him. He's like, you know, he was being a neighbor unto him. It's like, okay, come with me, okay? That kind of thing. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I would not have you to do that for me, and I'm certainly not going to do it for you when it comes in regard to the steal of the Jesuit poniard. This guy is not saved. And, no, and these people, these Christians who are promoting this, they're not saved either. Exodus chapter 21, verses 21 under verse 25. If men strive and hurt, woman, hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished, according as the woman's husband will lay upon him. And he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, then shalt, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Okay? That is what it means loving your neighbor as yourself. Not that you would go and kill yourself with the steel of the Jesuit poignard because these Christians tell you that that's how you love your neighbor. No, 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 no. 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 No, dear friend. No, no, no. Now, as far as... Let's get back to this um, article. Okay? Now, this thing has... Um, went to screensaver in a couple times, okay? But picking up where we left off in this article. In contrast, I believe that, in contrast, I believe that I can be an instrument of God's mercy as can the researchers and pharmaceutical witchcraft sorcerers professionals who created the vaccine and the many hands that have delivered it to us. Indeed, now here's a bold-faced lie. Jesus identified himself as the great physician. No, he did not. You know what this guy is perverting? Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And remember how we looked at 
how the world will label you as a Christian and it's better for you to be labeled as a Christian than labeled as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, and a busybody in other men's matters. But yet, to love your neighbor as yourself, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you, be quiet. Study to ensure yourself quiet. Mind your own business. Okay? D uh, don't um, go forth hastily to strive. Okay? Luke chapter 4, verse 23. Okay? Jesus Christ, our God, our Father, never once called himself the great physician. He never identified himself as the great physician. Great physician. Find it for me. He never did that. He never did that. Here's what this guy is doing. Okay? And this is Luke 4, verses 22, on to verse 24. And all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb. Do you get that? Ye, plural, more than one. Multitudes, most likely. Ye will say unto me this proverb. You are going to attribute to me. You are going to say this of me. You know where it says, uh, uh, friend of publicans and sinners? Uh, the Pharisees said that. That why eateth he with uh, publicans and sinners? Okay? Jesus himself never said, I am a friend of, pub of, of uh, publicans and sinners. Again, they labeled that unto him. Even though he is. Even though our Lord Jesus Christ is. Yes, he is. He is a friend to the, to the weak, to the meek, to the lowly, to the humble. Yes. But those who walk in pride, he is able to abase. But, okay, let's pick this up again. And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb. They're going to say to him, Physician, heal thyself. Great physician. No. Physician, heal thyself. They will say unto him, like this guy just did. Jesus identified himself as the great physician. Ye will say unto, say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. A prophecy about how he heals others, yet he cannot heal himself. If he be the Christ, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him, because the Jews require a sign. Jesus never identified himself as the great physician. The guy bold-faced lied to you. And interesting, he didn't give any scripture verse reference for that. <laughs> Not even a Bible verse reference for that. But this is the closest you're going to get. And in context, ye will surely say unto me, this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. That's the closest you're going to get to it. Jesus never identified himself as the great physician. The great physician. He lied. Imagine that. Back to the article. In contrast, I believe that I can be an instrument of God's mercy, more like God's wrath, as can the researchers of the pharmacaea, of the pharmacaea, yeah, pharmaceutical professionals who created the vaccine and the many hands that have delivered it to us. Indeed, Jesus identified himself as the great physician. And you'll see in the link, he underlines it. When he was criticized for, criticized for spending time with social undesirables like tax collectors, it is not healthy. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Now think about that. Think about that, brethren. Okay? What did, uh, hold on, my... my my computer is acting up on me here. Okay. So, note what he, uh, he, he tried to say there. 
it's those who are not healthy. Those who are not healthy don't need a physician, but they that are sick. So everyone is sick. Because what are the symptoms of the poison crown? Poison crown. Look that up in Latin and you'll know what I'm saying. Okay? What are the symptoms of the poison crown? Uh, headache, nausea, um, runny nose, flu symptoms, diarrhea, walking, breathing, talking, blinking. This guy is perverting scripture like uh, incredibly, incredibly. Go to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Okay. This guy here, when he said this, okay, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I'm not sick. I'm not sick. Okay. Mark chapter 2. And this is referenced in Matthew 9, verses 10 on to 13, and uh, Luke 5, verses 27 on to verse 32. Look these up on your own time. Mark chapter 2, verses 15 on to verse 17. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, uh, Levi, uh, what is that, uh, Matthew, I believe it is, many publicans and sinners sat also with Jesus at his, and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, they said, they labeled us as Christians. We don't call ourselves that. They said unto his disciples, how is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole need, have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So yes, those who are whole no, uh, have no need of the physician, but those that are sick. I'm not sick. My wife isn't sick. And for our government, our Jesuit-controlled government, pushing everybody get the steel of the Jesuit poniard and then put us who have not and refuse in concentration camps, green zones as they're calling them now, woe unto those that call evil good and good evil, which put light for darkness and darkness for light who uh, put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's in the book of Isaiah, chapter uh, chapter 3, I believe. Check it out. Okay? Yes. Those who are whole need not the physician, but those who are sick. Go to Leviticus, chapter 13. Leviticus, chapter 13. Leviticus chapter 13, verses 38 on to verse 46. This is talking about leprosy. A contagion, a skin disease. If any man, if a man also or a woman have in the skin of their flesh bright spots, even white bright spots, then the priest shall look, and behold, if the bright spots in the skin of their flesh be darkish white, it is a freckled spot that groweth in the skin. He is clean. And the man whose hair is fallen off his head, he is bald, yet is he clean. And he that hath his hair fallen off from part of his head toward his face, he is forehead bald, yet is he clean. And if there be in the bald head or bald forehead, a white reddish sore, it is a leprosy sprung up in his bald head or his bald forehead. Then the priest, not the Jesuit priest, shall look upon it and behold, if the rising of the sore be white reddish in his bald head or in his bald forehead, as the leprosy appeareth in the skin of the flesh, 
He is a leprous man. He is unclean. The priest shall pronounce him utterly unclean. His plague is in his head. Those who are whole need not the physician, but those that are sick. And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, and his head bare, and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip, not the nose, but the upper lip. Why? So you can breathe. See, when you exhale, you're breathing out CO2, and the Jesuits, they want you to wear the muzzle. So you're breathing in your own exhaust, weakening yourself, weakening your immune system. And he shall put a covering upon his upper lip and shall cry, unclean, unclean. They who are whole need not the physician, but they that are sick. Okay? All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone... Without the camp shall his habitation be. So the sick, covering over their upper lip, not their nose, so they don't breathe in their own exhaust. And the sick shall be isolated. So what the Jesuit order is instituting upon us right now, people, right now, is against Scripture. And this guy's a Christian. He's a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's a Christian, all right. And while we're here, go to Second Chronicles, chapter 16. Covered this one before in another video, I think. But uh, Second Chronicles, chapter 16. This is King Asa. King Asa. And he was afflicted. Okay? King Asa was afflicted by God because of, uh, I mean, and he was a godly king. But note this, okay? Uh, he, um, a prophet came to warn King Asa of something. And um, because a prophet came to uh, warn King Asa, he got mad with the seer. And um, also uh, was wroth with him and also uh, oppressed some of the people at that time. Read the whole context on your own time about King Asa, okay? But verses 11 under verse 12 about King Asa. And behold, the acts of Asa, first and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. To the physicians, not to the Lord. Interesting, huh? Very interesting. And the Jesuits have instituted a fictitious psychological operation today. And everybody is a potential carrier. Everybody is sick. You can have it and you don't know it. Blinking, breathing, walking, talking are all signs of the poison crown, according to them. And you people are going to trust these these guys, huh? Huh? Let's continue with the article. In the Old Testament, the prophet Ezekiel taught that this, and now he's quoting, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. And this was reinforced by Jesus in the parable of the Good Samaritan. 
Jesus held us held up an example of how we should treat our neighbors when he described how the Samaritan encountered a half-dead traveler on the road and bound up his wounds pouring oil pouring on pouring on oil and wine. A priest and a Levite passed the traveler first and ignored his suffering, crossing to the other side of the road. But it was the Samaritan Jesus identified as the as the true neighbor because he cared for the stranger. Okay? So, let's, uh, what is this guy again talking about in the Old Testament in Ezekiel? Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34. Now, this guy is taking this out of context. He's using this to guilt trip people who are naive. Who are, are, who are their own gods, who save themselves by their own belief, okay? He's guilt-tripping these people. Here's what he's not telling you. Here, let's read the context of this. Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 1 under verse 6. And note who's being addressed here. He's using it as a guilt trip. What is he, what is really being said here? And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Okay? Should they not feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. That's exactly what all these Christian hirelings in these church buildings are doing. They want you to come to their church building. Who are you sending them to? Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ through the scriptures? No, they need to go to a church. They need to go to a local congregation. They need to start tithing. Uh, yeah. 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 He's addressing false prophets. Verse 4. The disease... The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. He, this guy, he, he uh, put together two verses and left out the rest of the verse. Oh, gee, imagine a Catholic doing that. Catholic? This guy's a Catholic? Mm -hmm. But look at that. But with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. The priest, uh, a horrible and wonderful thing has happened in the land. Um, oh, oh what, what, what is that? What is that? That's in Jeremiah. One second. Sorry about that. I had to find this. Jeremiah chapter 5. Verses 30 on to verse 31. A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof? Verse 5 in Ezekiel chapter 34. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Not seeking the lost, not seeking the sheep. No, this guy wants to kill you people. He had these people, these Christians who are saying get the steel of the Jesuit poniard because it's your Christian duty to, uh, for you to do, they're lying to you. They only concern, they're only concerned about themselves. They have no concern for you. If they had concern for you, they would be preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ onto you from the scriptures. They're lying. But on the shepherd, on the shepherd, Zechariah, Zechariah, chapter 11. Okay. Zechariah, chapter 11. 
verses 15 on to verse 17. And the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall not visit those that are cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat, and tear their claws in pieces. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm, and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. A foolish shepherd. The foolish shepherd there in context is Satan. And Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And no marvel that his ministers are transformed also as ministers of righteousness. It's your righteous duty as a Christian to take the steel of the Jesuit poniard. Absolutely not. If you're saved, born again, converted, a new creature in Christ Jesus, yeah. The steel of the Jesuit poniard is poison. And no wonder, because it comes from the Jesuit order, who are masters of poisoning. And then he read about the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, huh? Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 on to verse 37. Here's what this guy isn't mentioning. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal, eternal life? He said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? That's going to come into play later. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Ye are those who justify yourselves among men, and that which is esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. How can ye believe those of you that receive honor one of another and not the honor that cometh from God only? How can ye believe? Justifying himself. A little pride going on there. If I seek to justify myself, my mouth shall prove me perverse. Aha. So see, this guy here, this lawyer, wanted to seek that he was looking to justify himself. Look at how good I am. Look at how righteous I am because I'm not judging you and I love you enough to take the steel of the Jesuit poniard. I'm doing this for you, bro. Yeah. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wound and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead which these people are doing themselves. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Now, the priest and the Levite were like this lawyer, full of themselves. Pride, wanting to justify themselves. Okay. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. 
Which now of these thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, He that shewed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. But see, this lawyer at first was seeking to justify himself. That's the whole thing. He was full of pride. He was self-righteous. And he proved that by, by uh, his question. Okay? He proved it absolutely. Okay? <laughs> One second, brethren. Okay? So let's continue in this article. Whoa! Whoa! This thing went all the way back to the top. Oops, oops, I beg your pardon, brethren. One second. Sorry about that, my other laptop went schizo on me. Let's continue with this article. Sadly, once nearly, every, once nearly eradicated childhood diseases are on the rise as more people claim religious exemptions to decline va vaccinations for their children. These people are monsters. Yet practically no major religion prohibits vaccination. No major religion prohibits vaccination. The Lord does. The authorized version of the scriptures do. And some consider it an obligation because of the, of the potential to save lives, lives, excuse me, as the COVID-19 vaccine, vaccines clearly do. Ha! 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 Yeah. No major religion prohibits vaccination. He has it underlined. Really? Yeah, these Christian religions, yeah, sure. Yeah. But is the church of the living God? Let's look at some examples of this. Okay? Old Testament. Really good one. Amos chapter 4. Amos chapter 4. Not Haggai, Brad. Amos chapter 4. Verses 6. On to verse 13. I am, he, he, our Lord said, I am not, uh, those who are whole need not a physician, but those that are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And the sick are the ones that are to be isolated. The sick are the ones to have a covering on their upper lip. Okay? And they're pushing today, those who have the steel of the chisel of poniard, to verse the law. But they're the ones who are protected. Okay? Amos chapter 6, verse 6 unto the close of the chapter. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities. Ah, that's famine. And want of bread in all your places. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And also I have withholden the rain from you. Drought. When there were yet three months to harvest, and I caused it to rain upon one city, and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered on to one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. So famine, which is coming, drought, which is basically here, <laughs> okay? I have smitten you with blasting and mildew, when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased. The palmer worm devoured them. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young women have I slain with the sword, and have taken away your horses, and have made the stink of your camps to come up unto your nostrils. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. 
Uh, you know, the Lord will do things to some of us, a lot of you people, to get your attention and you don't turn to him. America is without hope. America, a godly nation? Hardly. No. But America is a Christian nation. Yeah. You look at those blokes like uh, Phil Robinson and that disgusting Kurt Cameron. Yeah. Look at those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Two peas in a pod. Yeah. Yeah. America is a Christian nation. Yeah, absolutely. But it is not a nation that is blessed of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. But a curse is upon America. Verse 11. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrown through Sodom and Gomorrah, and ye were as a firebrand plucked out of, out of the burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. God has allowed all this stuff for judgment, people. How many of you are turning to him? But no, you're turning to the, that foolish shepherd and his ministers of righteousness. You're not turning to the Lord. And you've got this devil here working for the Vatican. I'll prove it to you in a moment. Verse 12. Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God. O Israel. What does that mean? You're going to die. Prepare to meet thy God. You might be an atheist. You might be a Catholic. It doesn't matter what you are. The Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, is your God. And you're going to stand before him and give an account of yourself. Whether at the judgment seat of Christ or at the great white throne. Which one is it going to be, tough guy? For lo, he that formeth the mountains and createth the wind and declareth unto man what is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness and treadeth upon the high places of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. <laughs> and and you got to remember too, people. Got to remember this too. 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Verses 22 on to verse 23. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And every single one of you who are an atheist claim to be, you don't believe in a God? Yes, you do. It's the one that you look at in the mirror. You are your own God. You are your own king. Ye shall be like the Most High. Therefore, because you have rebelled, which is with, which is writ, witchcraft, you're turning to the instruments of a foolish shepherd. You're turning to Satan instead of turning on to the Lord. It's witchcraft. Pharmakeia is witchcraft. Pharmacies, you know, pharmaceutical drugs. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. You're idolizing yourself, dear man, dear woman. Let's continue with this article. <laughs> These vaccines contain no aborted fetal cells. Uh, maybe not all of them. But they have mRNA, graphene oxide, VMAT2 inhibitors, MRC5, hmm, um, adjuvants, spike proteins. 
Hmm, interesting. But MRC5, look that up. Lying to you. Though their development did include the use of fetal cell lines during dating to the 1970s. Let me state unequivocally that abortion and the use of aborted fetal tissue are morally, morally wrong. Here's the kicker. Here's where you know what this man is. But I agree with the Vatican's direction that it is morally acceptable. Ah, ah. The Vatican. This guy's a coadjutor. This guy's probably a Jesuit. This guy's a Catholic. For Catholics to take the COVID-19 vaccines, their ethical reasoning is sound and should be persuasive to other Christian denominations as well. You will see the article. I'll link it in the description box. He agrees with the Vatican. Alberto Rivera, his testimony. His testimony. I'm going to share a little bit of this with you. Okay? Just a little bit of this. All right. What am I going to share with you? I, I, I had it here. I, I had it here. I had a, is there anything else to, that I should share with you? No. Okay. I'm going to share this right here, this and this right here. Okay. Pause that and read it if you can. Okay. Then let me see. I'm going to share this right here with you. Okay. Reading from Alberto Rivera's testimony. Now back to how I destroyed the Baptist Church in Venezuela. One half of the church believed the Roman Catholic institution was a Christian church. And I would tell them this. Oh yes, I have many relatives in the Catholic Church who love the Lord and I believe are saved Christian believers. It is a Christian church. Those who don't believe this are causing tremendous division and damage to the body of Christ. Many have been destroyed in their own Christian faith when pastors attack them. It causes all kinds of confusion, distortion, and dissension. We must stop. We must preach love. These are Jesuit phrases. Sound familiar? Then the pastor, and then to the pastor and those backing him, I would say, Oh, Pastor, you are right. The Catholic Church is not Christian. I've suffered at their hands in Spain. They hate Christians. My dear Pastor is still in prison. You must cry out against it. Look at my name in the newspaper. They called me a her heretic. And at this time, Alberto Rivera was with the Jesuits, okay? And he infiltrated and destroyed these people, this, this church building and stuff and whatnot, okay? And that's what, that's what these infiltrators do. They come in with a lot, you know, preaching the love gospel, the ecumenical Vatican Council II, the smoke screen, to bring everybody under the headship of Rome, the herd mentality. This guy is a Catholic. This Dr. Wong, he's a Catholic, probably a Jesuit, at the least, at the least, a Jesuit coadjutor, pointing to the Vatican. Okay? Three pastors fell, a Methodist, a Pentecostal, and a four-square minister. 
We would demand they stop being anti-Catholic or else. The mission was successful. All three pastors became ecumenical. Vatican II. They started only preaching about the love of God. They would never say anything the, that the Roman Catholics were... They would never say again that the Roman Catholics were going to hell, all according to our instructions. In the Bible, I'm reading this as well. In the Bible college, the last straw was when I talked the students into a three-day hunger strike to improve conditions. Again, it broke the news that, again, it broke the news. The school was at the point of going under. The Catholic priests were demanding it be closed it's a tool it's a tool of the devil they claimed alberto rivera you are under arrest when the schools uh, school officials tried to get me sent out of the country the vatican through the government of spain claimed that claimed i was an army deserter i was removed before they could discover i was a jesuit this guy here preaching the love gospel and you see guys like rick warren and uh, all these other, these, these Christian church buildings today, especially in my town, all ecumenical, bringing everybody. We got to preach love. Jesus, God loves you. God's not going to judge you. We are, we're not judging you. <laughs> but I agree with the Vatican's direction that it is morally acceptable for Catholics to take the COVID-19 vaccines. Their ethical reasoning is sound and should be persuasive to other Christian denominations as well. Like the non-denominationals, like the uh, Lutherans, which are Catholics, to the Baptists, to the Pentecostals, to the Methodists, to the Calvinists. See why I'm not a Christian? See why you shouldn't be attributing to yourself Christian either? Of course, the ultimate goal for Christians, and here's another giveaway that this guy's Catholic, uh, coadjutor at the least, Jesuit at the most. Of course, the ultimate goal for Christians is not just good health in this life, but an eternity with God. When asked by a lawyer, we already looked at this, what he had to do to inherit eternal life, Jesus pointed him back to the law. And he has that underlined. Ah. The law, like the Ten Commandments, the Deokate, I believe they call it in Catholic terminology. Love the Lord thy love the love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Right. Right. He said Jesus pointed him back to the law. What is the law? The Ten Commandments. The Levitical law. Which which was there for the dispensation under the law. But see, unto the Catholic, salvation is by works. What Jesuits do, dear friends, they are masters of euphemistic language. They change the definition of terms. Perfect example. Repentance is going from unbelief to belief. That's what the easy believism devils do. Okay? Okay, that's a perfect example. But what is the law? The law is contained in the scriptures. Yes, yes it is. The Ten Commandments, the Levitical law, yes. Okay, yes, that is the law. But unto the Catholic, what is the law? What is the law to a Catholic? What is the law to a Catholic? The catechism. The tradition. Oh, what's that? Oh, the traditions of men. They, the Catholics, 
have redefined what the law is while claiming to adhere, adhere to the law. Tradition. See, a Catholic, a Pharisee, is someone who holds tradition above Scripture. That's what Catholics do. And he says that Jesus turned him back to the law. See, and while Jesus was first on the earth, before the death, burial, and resurrection, they were still under the law. And Catholics want you to bring that want to bring you under their law, which they loosely base off of the Ten Commandments, and they write whole books written by men to define it. The law, the law, huh? The law. Let's talk about the law. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. What about the law? The Ten Commandments were there for what? The, the Ten Commandments are God's perfect, holy, righteous laws for us. But see, you and I at our best state, we can never keep the law. If you offend at one point... You offend that at all. If you break one commandment, you've broken them all. You and I, at our best, cannot keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. So what was the point? Romans chapter 3, verses 27, on to verse 31. Wherefore is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Why? Because the perfect sacrifice for sins have already been made. Unlike unto the Catholic that worshiped the little wafer god and drink blood, okay? And they to them the little wafer god is that the actual flesh of Jesus, okay? Is he the god of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. What does he mean? Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verses 1 on to verse 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh." that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Okay? And then again, you can go ahead and read Romans chapter 7, oh, verses uh, 1 on to verse 14, on your own time, okay, for more about the law. But go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. We might re end up reading that anyway. Got a little bit of time left. Galatians chapter 3, verses 19 on to verse 29. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgression, transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one, spirit, soul, and body. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, under sin 
that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But, af but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Hold your place. We have to go. We have to go to Romans chapter 7. We have to. We have to. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 on to verse 14. What does Paul mean? Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath How, the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress. Though she be married to another man, wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Work, what does that mean? The motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members. Um, because God's laws are written in our hearts, whether you want to believe that or accept that or not. We know that murder is wrong. We know that lying is wrong. We know that stealing is wrong. Why? Because God's laws are written in our hearts. And the law, the Ten Commandments, when you become aware of them, clearly prove that to you. Okay? But see, you can't keep the law perfectly. Without sin. You can't. Nobody can. Only one did. Jesus Christ, God our Father, who is God the Father. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? He is our Father. So let's continue this. But now ye are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein ye were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Oldness of the letter is referring on to the Old Testament law, okay? The law that we do not keep today. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. This is something that people like to, who uh, don't want you to read the uh, scriptures will quote to you. Who, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, Old Testament law, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth. The Old Testament law killeth. Yes. But the Spirit giveth life. What does the Old Testament law kill? Your self-righteousness. Your clinging to innocence. The, the law is there to show you you are guilty and that you cannot save yourself because those are God's perfect laws. You can't keep them at your best. So yeah, it kills your self-righteousness. The letter killeth. Yeah, it kills you. It's there to bring life, yes, to keep you from sin, but it kills you because you know you can't keep it. Let's continue in Romans chapter 7. What shall we say then? Verse 7, is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, here it is. I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. The law is there to show you your sin, to show you that you cannot keep the laws perfectly. God's perfect, holy, just requirements are the Ten Commandments, yes. But you, 
You, Mr. Comfort, Mr. Paul Washer, all of you wicked, sinful, um, uh, uh, not, yeah, easy believism guys, you are devils, but you sinless perfection people, you can't, you can't keep the law perfectly. No one can. The only one who could just happened to be, happened to be God. Because only God can keep that which is perfect. You can't. But sin, verse 8, taking occasion by the commandment, showing you your sin. Taking occasion by the commandment. See, it says that, but oh, doesn't that look so beautiful? Wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. When someone tells you, don't do that because it's against the law, you can touch all of this, but that red button, don't touch it. What happens instinctively in you? Because of the old man. You want to touch that red button, don't you? It, it, what does it do? It wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, animalistic lust. The law says don't covet, but your flesh, but your flesh, Verse 3 in Romans chapter 8. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Okay? So sin by the commandment saying, Thou shalt not covet. But your flesh is like, Oh, I want that. So it, re so it uh, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Because you didn't know what sin was without the law. For I was alive without the law once, ignorant. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment, which is ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Why? The commandment is ordained to life, to keep you from sin. But why? It is found to be unto death. The letter killeth, because you can't keep it. It kills you. It shows you, uh, uh, where is that? O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He's not condoning sin. It's like, go ahead and sin because grace will take care of it. No, no. What he's saying is, I'm going to sin. I can't help it because sin is in the flesh and my spirit and soul are in this flesh. See? See? The letter killeth. I found it to be unto death. It was, it was ordained unto life to keep you from it, but it kills you because you can't keep it. It kills your self-righteousness. You can't, at your best, you can never do it. And these poor Catholics, through their law, think that they can be that way. This guy, this Andrew Wong, He's a devil. He's a Catholic. He's a Jesuit coadjutor, a Jesuit at the most. He's a devil. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, yes, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. The law itself, no. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Trying to get you back under the law, people. Okay? This guy's the devil. Go back to Galatians chapter 3, picking up at verse 26. For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Salvifically, pertaining to salvation. Culturally, that's a different thing. But in salvation, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. 
And remember, remember again, people. Okay, remember. Second, uh, First Corinthians chapter two. First Corinthians chapter two. If you are saved of the church of the living God, okay. If you are saved of the church of the living God, God dwells within you, okay. First Corinthians chapter two, verses one and two. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Excellency of speech, like this Catholic devil, Andrew Wong, has done. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified, who is truly saved of the church of the living God. Not a Christian! Okay? And remember, church of the living God. Remember, we already looked at it. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 on to verse 18. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, if you are truly saved, born again, converted, of the church of the living God? Okay? If any man defile the temple of God, any man saved, yourself, brethren, or lost, the Jesuits, those of the world. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, like this idiot guy is, let him become a fool that he may be wise. If any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. Because the temple of God is holy, which ye are. Because God lives within you, okay? Remember, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Verses 20 on to verse 21. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ is in you, and you're going to put that poisonous toxin of the steel of the Jesuit poniard into you? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 12 on to verse 14. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, and whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, Unto the praise of his glory. We're sealed. The Holy Ghost is in us. The Lord is that spirit. Okay? God lives within you. That circumcision made without hands. Okay? Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among you Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Perfect in heart, not sinlessly perfect, okay? Whereunto I also labor, striving according to the, his working which worketh in me mightily. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Brethren, people, this man is a Christian. He's not saved. And yeah, maybe to get the steel of the Jesuit poniard is the Christian thing to do. But if you are of the church of the living God,
No way. Beware lest anyone spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Let's finish this article up. Some Christians may, may parse scripture to find narrow objections to taking the COVID-19 vaccine. But, overarching, but the overarching command from our Lord is unmistakable. Our actions must be driven by our love of God and love of others. Which I just read to you. The love gospel is the ecumenical movement, the smokescreen of Vatican II. It's Catholic. And as we looked in the book of Amos, things may happen to you, and you're going to go to the instruments of a foolish shepherd. Well, the Christian might tell you it is your duty to roll it up and take the steel of the Jesuit poniard out of love those who are of the church of the living God who truly care for you. And those of you who are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, not a Christian, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 14 on to the close of the chapter and we'll be done. This Andrew Wong, like I said, he's a Catholic. He's a Jesuit at the most, a coadjutor at the very least. Okay? Second uh, Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 on to verse 18. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, Satan? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, like Catholics? And what agreement hath the temple of God, which temple of God ye are, your body, because God dwells in you, with idols? Ah. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Amen. 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 It's these types of people that are doing the most danger. You know, you got these devil, easy believism heretics who are preparing people to take the mark of the beast after we, the church of the living God, have been resurrected. But these people who are actually doing the killing. You're, you call yourself, you're a Christian? And you're saying it's your duty to kill yourself? The Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. You're going to pay for what you've done. That's going to be it for this video. That, that, I've had enough of this. I've had enough of this. Nonsense. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. I'm going to tell you people who are watching this, I don't know how long this video will stay up on YouTube. I have a backup plan, though, if this doesn't stay up that long. I have another, another channel. Not here on YouTube, but on another platform. So if they take this one down, this vid well, this video is going on the other channel that I have uh, created on another platform. 
Uh, but um, not going to let that out yet. And hey, you, if you find it, there's a video on there that you'll like particularly there, my good friend. You know who you are. People. No one who is truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God would be pushing you to kill yourself. These Christians who are pushing this, they're not saved. And we as the church of the living God, brother, sister, look at me. Stop calling yourself a Christian. These are Christians. The world, I don't care what you think. I don't care if it's been for centuries. You cling to 1 Peter chapter 4 as if it were done on your shoe or something, man. Get over it. They labeled us as Christians. We never called ourselves that. We never did. Time for a distinction. Time for separation. It's now. Because who knows how long we got to go. Okay? I mean, when you got lost people who can see this, like Tim Truth, he's a lost man. But he sees, he sees more than these Christians do. That's scary. Take heed to these. If this offends you, good. Good. I hope it does. Consider these things. No, no one who is truly saved is going to push this on to you. It's going to be it for this video. And I um, don't know how long this will be up. I pray the Lord that he'll keep this up long enough for some people to see it. Thank you, brother. I love you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for all that you have done for us. We'll see you in the next video. And we love you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.